right, well, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, I'm Charles Minguez, SDR here at One to One. We are very excited to have Jason McNew with us here today. He has over 20 years of experience working in the IT industry. Um, super excited to have him here today talking about IoT um, and how uh, that tool can be used to benefit your business. Jason, I'll turn it over to you if you wanna go a little bit deeper into your background. Okay, thanks Charles. Um, well, I'll, I'll say mainly I spent a lot of years with the White House Communications Agency. I'm a United States Air Force veteran. Uh, it was White House Communications Agency, Camp David Special Missions Command 2003 through 2014. So I, I spent a lot of years working in buildings with no windows, surrounded by barbed wire and machine guns, and sort of these extreme security environments, top secret special access programs. I had a presidential access clearance during that time known as Yankee White. In 2017, I founded a small consulting practice called Stronghold Cybersecurity. Uh, educationally, I have a master's degree in cybersecurity from Penn State, and I'm a certified information system security professional. Um, and we're here to talk about IoT, inter Internet of Things. Um, before we go into that, the driving conversation here is security because IoT in, uh, introduces risk into our enterprise. And IoT is great. It does all kinds of interesting things, not just in our homes, um, and many people have it, uh, but in the enterprise. There's a lot of use cases for it in the enterprise, but when we bring IoT into the enterprise, that is going to introduce risk that we need to control. Uh, and we'll get into what, what that means. So let's talk about what is cybersecurity. And this is a CAN definition. And if I was teaching this in, in college or something, I would you know maybe ask you to memorize this. But cybersecurity is the practice of deploying people, policies, processes, and technologies to protect organizations, their critical systems, and sensitive information from digital attacks. And again, you might have to memorize that, but cybersecurity is the business of managing risk. And uh, in, in a scientific and measurable way. And cy cybersecurity only makes sense to the extent that it reduces business risk or saves you money. And we have to be able to quantify those things either uh, mathematically, quantitatively, qualitatively, and be able to express that on paper and say, yes, we're getting a return on investment for this money that we're spending on cybersecurity. And for most businesses, cybersecurity is going to be spending. It's not, go it's not something that's going to improve your revenue. It's not a revenue center. Uh, it's like safety. So we um, we need to have the right amounts in the right places. This is an interesting pie chart here. Look at internet distribution, internet users distribution in the world 2021. And when I present live, people are always shocked at this. Uh, less than 7% of the world's internet users are actually in North America, despite the fact that the internet was you know created here. Uh, but, but that's because most of the, the world's people are outside of, uh, outside of North America. But most of the world's internet users are in Asia, Europe, Africa. Uh, there's some in Middle, Middle East, Australia, and, and other places as well. Now, in spite of that fact, uh, less than 7% of the world's internet users are in North America. Only over close to 94%, 95% of the attacks are on North Americans. Uh, and the reason for that is, is it's mainly, it's, think of um, the old, there's an old saying that all roads lead to Rome, right? And that's no longer true in the modern day. All roads, I would argue, they lead to America. We export our culture, our entertainment, sports, fashion, technology. Uh, probably, I think the most valuable, the most recognizable brand image in the world is what the New York Yankees. You could go up into the mountains in the Himalayas and, and see villagers wearing New, New York Yankees caps, right? So <laughs> when criminals, wherever they are, decide who they're going to rob, they're going to rob. Well, who, who do they, uh, the perception is that the streets, you know, the streets and the roads in America are paved with gold. And from a certain point of view, that is is true. If you live in, you know, the outward, the outskirts of uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, or the foothills of Rio de Janeiro, uh, Rio de Janeiro, or, uh, you know, a landfill in Mumbai or something like that, of course, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of driving factors to why all this crime is, is, uh, being driven in our direction. And for the purpose of small small to mid-sized businesses, most of this is gonna be organized crime. It's plain old robbery. Uh, they're, they're stealing from the rich, you, and then giving to the poor, which which is them. In some cases, they're gonna be solo hackers or nation states, but something I think 94 or 95% of is financially driven. There's gonna be some espionage, uh, some hacktivism. Sometimes it's just plain old, um, uh, uh, you know, damaging things. Um, defacing things uh so look at this is a map of uh well that's the soviet union remember that right uh, when i was a kid you would turn on the tv and you would see uh images of people escaping over the wall from east berlin into west berlin and that that world is gone 
But the reason why I bring this up is because for all of its other failings, the STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math education, and we didn't call it STEM then, but the STEM education in the communist bloc and in, in modern day Eastern Europe and Russia and a lot of areas in Asia is really, really good. And it's better, it's better than ours is. Um, we had a new colleague at uh, ConnectWise where I worked come on in a couple of months ago, and she was from Eastern Europe, I want to say from Moldova or something like that. And she settled in New Jersey. And she put her kids in a public school and they were taking math that they had had two or three years ago. And it really surprised her. And so it doesn't surprise me. It's it's well known. And I'm not saying this to pick on America or anything like that. My point is that you have people all over the world and a lot of them are, they're well educated. You know, they're hardly dumb. You look at some of the things that, uh, the, you know, the Russians, they put a man in space or the Moscow Institute of Heat is one of the greatest university, uh, technical universities in the world. So we have some, you know, some smart people that we're, we're fighting against. And there's a lack of economic opportunity. So imagine that you're in, you know, Belarus or Moldova or something like that. And you've gotten out of school and you were taking trigonometry in 12th grade and you can't find a job and you're piddling with software engineering. Well, maybe we'll rob Europeans or rob Americans or something like that. But it's a lot of contributing things to this, but it's mainly robbery. I view it as kind of being a war of sorts. Wars historically have been fought over resources. Uh, the ancients fought wars over salt, spices, all kinds of things. Um, this is simply a war for uh, finance, for money, American dollars. Um, if you go into a search engine, search engine, and you put in type hackers and then click images, is what that's not what they look like at all. Uh, they probably look more like you or me, Charles. A lot of them are uh, educated, um, and uh, the 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 caricature that uh, media pushes about hackers it kind of drives me crazy because I think it it uh, lulls people into a sense of security that you're dealing with goofy kids or you know um 400 pound fat guy in their parents basement or something like that but uh, a lot of cases these are engineers with stem degrees uh and they these organizations look smell act and taste like real businesses they have engineers they have project managers they have help desk people they have financial targets they rent square footage they look and operate exactly like a real business it's just that what they're doing is uh, immoral and unethical and it might not even be illegal where they happen to be there's not legal prohibitions against hacking everywhere in the world so there's some countries where if you set up a shop and you're hacking americans or europeans the authorities aren't going to do anything about it because there's no law against it they don't care they have enough other problems to deal with besides the fact that you're using computers to rob americans it doesn't that's a really it good doesn't call out it doesn't move the needle for them right so they you know they operate from specific jurisdictions and they pick their targets in such a manner so that they don't attract the attention of interpol or the fbi or their own state security services you know you pick the right targets and you can stay out of trouble um so with that stuff, with all that said, we're here to talk about IoT and Internet of Things. And IoT refers to basically these sort of random devices that you have connected, Internet connected devices that you have. I have animated slides here. I thought that I removed those. <laughs> animated slides drive me crazy. But so what is the Internet uh, Internet of Things? It's a network of smart devices that communicate via the Internet. And um, from what I've I've heard is the terminology originally uh, arose at Procter and Gamble as a as a way for engineers, people like you and me, Charles, to get uh, get the attention of their managers. So well, this is something we need to deal with. And um, so, well, what were the first worldwide IoT devices? ATMs, probably. I think we're probably the first things that were kind of widespread that were all over the place were connected to the internet. Um, you could argue that one. Uh, I'm sure there's all your arguments, but that's one of them. And according to Cisco, Cisco believes there's going to be about 500 billion total devices connected to the internet uh, by wow. 2030. Wow. That, boy, that is a huge number. That's a massive number. So securing all of that is... Uh, is going to be is going to be a challenge. So smart devices collect and exchange information uh, through remote control data monitoring, and there's uh, operating through camera sensors, software, or other systems. And for people that are listening, all of us have some degree of IoT in our houses, most likely, whether it's you know Alexa or Google. Um, these uh, smart thermostats, smart refrigerators, really anything that could be assigned an IP address and then connected to the internet is IoT. And this stuff has become so cheap and so ubiquitous that 
it's tend to have grown in kind of an uncontrolled manner. And now we have sort of, uh, you know, sort of a problem that we have to deal with. You know, we try to automate things and make this better and make that better. And now we have a bunch of things that are connected that we really don't know what they're doing and they're not properly controlled. And there's a bunch of cases of things exactly like this being used as attack vectors in very, very surprising ways. So these are some of the most most common uh, IoT communication protocols. Bluetooth, I think we all know what Bluetooth is. Your phone has it. A bunch of other devices, wi wireless speakers, remote controls, Wi-Fi, cellular, and then NFC is a lower data rate. NFC is, uh, you have to be, that is a, a much um, shorter range than some other devices. And there's other ways that IoT communicates, but these are kind of the main ones. What sectors use the IoT? Well, really all of them. I haven't seen any that don't. Um, uh, but manufacturing, transportation, construction, retail, education, these probably re this probably represents um, the folks that are listening in. But pretty much every sector of the economy is using IoT at some level now because automation makes your business better, faster, and cheaper. The more things you right. automate, the less time you have to waste on things that are not your core competency, whatever your core competency is. Uh, you know, just to provide an example, an old friend of mine that I uh, worked with for many, many years was a network engineer. And now he runs a brewery and their their passion is brewing beer, craft beer. But there's a million things that are ancillary to that. And they use IoT for automation. But uh, you want to focus on most businesses want to focus on your core competency. What is it that you do and and who, do you, who are you doing it for? Whatever that is. And businesses are all over the place. And uh, IT is supposed to lubricate those things and make it easier to do. But it also introduces risk that needs to be controlled. So we're going to talk about IoT, bots, uh, botnets, and malware. Uh, I'm coming down off of a cold, so just uh, just bear with me. Yeah, yeah no worries. Uh, I'm going to mute this for just a sec. So botnets are a collection of internet connected devices that an attacker is compromised and botnets can be anything. And botnets are why hackers are introduced or uh, interested, frankly, in, um, you know, your grandmother's computer or the computer in the back room of a candy store or something like that. Um, they break into it, they get a toehold, they install a back door, and then a human looks around and says, oh, well, this computer is nothing on it. It's filled with Sudoku and bingo or something, right? Uh, <laughs> it might not, it might we not be, it might not be able to use it for much, but we could use it to attack other computers. So a botnet is, is now you've got 10,000 or 100,000 or a million grandma's computers and IoT devices and thermometers and uh, just anything that has an IP address on it that's connected to the internet. And personally at home, as much, even though I'm a tech guy and I love automation, I love tinkering with stuff, I don't just take things out of the box and then connect it to the internet. And then um, I tend to be a little bit shy about that. And I still have regular manual, they're digital, but they're, I have digital thermostats in my house um, that are not connected to the internet. My refrigerator's not connected to the internet. I don't have a coffee maker that does that. Um, so I, I personally kind of limit my footprint of that, that stuff and I'll, I'll buy stuff like that and then tinker with it. But then I disconnect it from the network after right. the fact, because I don't have the time to understand the risk associated with every, sure. every single one of these things. But, uh, botnets can be used for uh, distributed denial of service attacks. If you want to take down a big target, uh, and you're, you have, uh, you know, a million computers, you could use it as a reflection attack to attack something big. Uh, spamming, spam, something like 85% of the email traversing the globe on a daily basis is still spam. Um, and spam is cheap and easy to do. It's, it's low risk. So botnets are used for that. Used for credential uh, theft, spying, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin mining. There's a bunch of different things that you could use. So anything is anything that's connected to the intra internet could potentially be compromised and then used by a bad, bad actor for something. <laughs> So traditional botnets versus IoT botnets. Traditional botnets, uh, we're, we're thinking about um, uh, workstations and, and servers, computers and servers, uh, and they tend to have uh, greater capabilities and they could do more damage, but IoT devices tend to be unguarded. Uh, computers and servers and routers and switches and your enterprise gear, that stuff tends to be well defended, but um, IoT devices, I've seen, I've worked with uh, clients that have bought 100 cl time clocks for their doing manufacturing or just different devices, and they connect them all to their regular flat network without uh, segmenting any of those things. And the risks are different, but the risks are still uh, very real. And you may have heard in the news not too long ago, a um, 
uh, a, a casino is compromised through a, 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 a thermometer in a fish tank. And yep. I have a slide on that and we're not going to get into that too much, but um, I- IOT botnets, cameras, routers, wearables, DVRs, things like that, not necessarily computers and servers and routers and switches. Um, the big stuff presents more risk, but uh, the IOT stuff, it, it's something that it, it tends to be not as well defended and it's not as easy to patch and defend. You can't install antivirus on your camera. So attacks on IoT, boy, Stuxnet, that was a big one. Um, that was a joint effort, a nation state level effort. And I've had briefings on that. So I have to watch what I say about it. But um, I, I can tell you that that was a billion dollar program, Stuxnet. There's a lot of stuff wow. that uh, that the, uh, the public didn't see about it. But that was a joint effort between two different nation states, from what I know. And it, it went to the highest levels of their intelligence and their their technical capabilities. And I, I believe they spent about a billion dollars on that. And it, its intent was to delay uh, Iran's nuclear program. And uh, that was originally seeded uh, into our uh, into Iran's uh, into their centrifuges um, from well from what was publicly disclosed, disclosed supposedly by dropping infected USB sticks in the parking lots that were being traversed by um, Iranian scientists because that was actually a closed system that system wow. was not connected to the internet so they had to get their they had to get their logic onto it somehow and that's supposedly wow. how they did it. Uh, why is IoT vulnerable? Mostly default settings. Years ago, we did take an, a router out of the box, some D-Link thing they bought for 59 bucks at Best Buy and connect it. <laughs> and I remember living in, in an apartment building in Washington, D.C. in the early, I don't know, 2003, 2004, and there was probably 15 of these things connected to uh, the internet in my building alone. And probably about half of them had default passwords on that. And I know because I checked them just out of curiosity. I was curious to see what people are doing. Um, and they tend to prioritize convenience over security. Most of the stuff, that's, especially things that are sold in the, you know, common retailers, box stores, they're uh, designed for ease of use. And the idea is that you take out of the box and then it's it walks through some in. kind of wizard and that connects to the internet. Yeah. So it's security over, over, over convenience. Um, when you buy a, a really good firewall, it's the exact opposite. You buy a, a you know, a, from a sonic wall it does nothing out of the box at all you have to right. turn on everything and then configure everything and defense and depth security we whitelist everything we enable it to do what we want um iot devices especially the inexpensive one tends to not uh, tends to work right out of the box so they prioritize convenience over security weak or broken cryptography if it's an older device it might be running older encryption algorithms that have been deprecated um, I've seen the idea floated that maybe we should um, design IoT devices to die after 10 years or 12 years or something like that. And it's an right. interesting thought exercise. I'm not necessarily endorsing that one, but I, when I read that, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. You know, yeah. because you could have something sitting on the network for 10, 12 years doing whatever, and it has an old deprecated protocol on it. There's some zero day attack um, on it, and you, and you don't know about it. So uh, that's just the thought. Um, universal uh, uh, plug and play exploitation is another problem. But it, the IoT in general, especially the consumer grade stuff, is designed to just work out of the box and it's really not designed to be secure. So it, it presents risk. And IoT, uh, uh, IoT in the enterprise, um, we see a lot of the same problems. We've seen adoption of IoT in small businesses and in enterprise. For the purpose of this brief, we're talking mainly about enterprise, but small businesses have the same issue. And you could be, you know, have 10 or 15 or 20 employees. And if you could purchase a, you know, something for a hundred bucks or 150 bucks, it's going to make your day-to-day life easier. Yeah. You're going to think about that. Yeah. But before we plug the thing in and then configure it to do what it's going to do, we need to have some type of an internal conversation. Well, what risk, um, or am I aware of the risk that this is uh, uh, introducing into my my systems? And that's a discussion that you should really have with one to one about 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 securing these things. So, criminals hacked a fish tank to steal data from a casino. This this one was wild. Was um, wild. I don't. You ever been out to Vegas, Charles? Vegas is I have. Like, you know yeah. you go out, you walk up the main drag, and there's pyramids, and there's fire, and lions, and tigers, all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff. Roller coasters in New York City. So it, it's very theatrical. So uh, it doesn't surprise me that you would go into uh, a, a, a casino and see a really crazy aquarium and one of the bot, this aquarium, aquarium system. Yeah. And uh, the monitoring was done remotely, as which is wise because it's cheaper. 
right? Sure. Are you gonna, are yep. you gonna drive out to there with your litmus test and pH yep. and you know all this other stuff? But if you gotta automate that, but this introduced risks. And what happened is there was some type of uh, uh, a problem with these devices, and hackers got into this and then moved laterally through the network and did a massive wow. exfiltration. So what that tells me off the bat is that this network was probably not designed properly because it's, it should have been segregated from the rest of the network anyway. This is why segmentation of a network is important. Um, and segmentation is uh, theoretically why the Titanic sank, right? It had, what was it, 11 bulkheads. And yep. uh, you know, the bulkheads didn't go all the way to the top, though. So the idea is that, yeah, we could lose one compartment or two, but after that, the thing's going to sink. And when you compartmentalize your network correctly, even if something does catch on fire and burn to the ground, it's not going to move laterally into the rest of your network. And that's why segmentation matters. And when people ask me, this is my personal opinion, when people ask me what I think of IoT, I think of it as like a Petri disk, a Petri dish. Yuck. This would be like. IOT to me be, would be like if somebody walked into my business and gave me a Petri dish and said, here, we want you to store this. <laughs> um, what's in it? Well, we're not going to tell you that. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yep. <laughs> I, a good analogy. So, it's a really good analogy. So, and they, and they said, okay, here, you have to keep this. I would buy a refrigerator, put that sucker in the basement, and then put it in the corner of the basement, and then put some <laughs> chains around it, and then leave it in there and say, okay, it's here. I did what you said. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. I, I don't yeah. know. I don't know what's in it. I Unless you really understand the supply chains, do you know where the thing was manufactured, who designed it, what plan it was made in, you know, whether or not those plans, the designs of it were actually um, secured from end to end. And we've had problems with supply chain poisoning from the stuff that we manufacture overseas. So you just don't know. Yep. Might, might sound a little bit paranoid, but. So going back to that fish tank hack, that's just the beginning of this, right? The first, uh, the bottom bar here is cyber attack, right? This is the attack, the reconnaissance. They're looking for something to attack. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure how exactly they got into that specific device, but it might've had a back door in it that had, you know, was phoning the mothership. But this is what provides bad actor access. So at some point they get access into the system, whether it's your system or it's your grandmother's system or it's an enterprise system or it's, you know, it, anything um solar winds and once they get access the next thing they're going to do is investigation and this kind of reminds me when i was a kid uh charles i grew up in um in wilkes-barre scranton area after uh hurricane agnes i was born in 73 and after yeah. that valley was kind of destroyed right and we used to, uh, when I was a kid, was a teenager, we would go into these old buildings and then explore the entire thing. You would find some window that was a jar or some some door, and then it's this massive two million square foot factory. And as kids, we went and we'd explore to every nook and cranny of this thing yeah, like to see what was in it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's kind of exactly once what they do. Once they find that door or that window, then um, they're going to hide it. We would, you know, put some barrels and some brush in front of it. You know, that was our persistent access. Yep, this is our right? spot. Yep. This is our spot. This is, we go over the fence, we go around the back, there's this door, and this is how, how we get in, right? So they do kind of the same thing. And then the next thing they're going to do is explore everything. And they take their time doing this. This might take weeks or months. Um, they're going to look at your network, look at your email, look at shares, uh, see what information they could get a hold of. And then once they've done that, then they're going to do exfiltration. They're going to exfiltrate as much as they can, even if they don't think they could necessarily use it. They want to get it out of there and then analyze it when they get it back you know, a uh, home so they could look at it and figure out, well, can we monetize it? Can we use it against you? Can we use it for, uh, you know, uh, can we use it for blackmail or extortion? And the next thing is going to be BCDR manipulation, backup, uh, backup, uh, disaster recovery, backup and disaster recovery, business continuity and disaster recovery. Here's the problem, Charles, I'm a military guy. I'm in IT. I know so many acronyms. I, I, I forget them sometimes. Right. <laughs> and sometimes a given acronym means three or four different things. <laughs> um, but anyways, business, con business continuity and disaster recovery. So they've been known to mess with your backup scheme. So even if you have functioning backups, it is imperative to check those backups and actually uh, verify that those backups are what you think they are because they will manipulate That's them. They've been known they've been known to change backup schemas so that instead of backing up your actual production data that you're backing up log files or some kind of garbage. Yep. Um, and then they'll let that sit for a couple of months so that your backups roll over. So now your backups are no good. Uh, then there's going to be production manipulation, ransom and the ransom request. And the ransom request is when they say we're here, we're here. Now it's time to do business. <clears throat> 
look in the left here, this is dwell time average of something like 200 days. Uh, this dwell time, this is when the bleeding starts. And uh, with advanced protective technologies and having a proper cybersecurity program in place that uh, one to one can help you with, we could get that dwell time down from 200 days to like two days or two hours or two minutes. That's this is what really matters is we need to we need to the second that they get in the door, we need to know then so that we could uh, uh, we could triage that and then close that door and then roll back any kind of damage they've done. So we're here to talk about IoT. However, right, we could get into defense in depth and uh, advanced protective technologies and SIEM and EDR and MDR and all these other things, but we're here to talk about IoT. So I've prepared a slide um, and we're going to talk about securing IoT in the enterprise. And I have two slides in this. I have an academic one and then I have the quick start, right? And uh, we're going to do the academic one first because this is the hard stuff. Uh, provision devices and systems with unique IDs and credentials. So all the IoT devices you have, um, all of them should have unique identification. They should have their own credentials. Do not reuse credentials across devices. Credential reuse is a big attack a, attack vector. A and that is that is not easy to do. It's hard to have separate uh, system IDs and credentials for every de device is not easy to do, but it's necessary in order to protect them adequately so that we can detect uh, an attack and then crush it right away. Um, if we find one single device that's attacked, that's attacked, and we find uh, that uh, is compromised, and we know that a particular username is assigned to it, we could disable that account right away and shut that device down, and then disconnect the thing from the network. And those usernames and IDs are not useful on other devices. Make sure you're using crypto crypt cryptographic uh, network protocols. This isn't a problem so much anymore. Um, we almost never see clear text protocols being used, but we do see old insecure deprecated protocols being used on older devices. So it's important to make sure that your devices are using modern cryptography that's not been deprecated. Uh, create continuous update and deployment mechanisms. So not all IoT is updatable, and if you buy a device that can't be upda updated, then that's going to be, uh, well, we have to secure that in a different way. But uh, when I did uh, assessments, I used to run Nessus across networks for weeks at a time, deep, uh, uh, deep vulnerability scanning. And I found that usually uh, things with operating systems on them usually tend to be reasonably well patched, but not always. Uh, sure. Third party software was the biggest problem, but IoT and firmware was always a mess. Uh, IoT and firmware tends to fall through the cracks and firmware is the software that runs hardware. And there's different devices that are connected to your network that run firmware that are not avail 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 immediately uh, uh, obvious to a user or even to a network administrator. But um, those are things that need to be part of your patch and vulnerability management program. Uh, deploy security auditing, uh, auditing and monitoring mechanisms. There needs to be some type of auditing and monitoring on your network uh, so that you could scan these things. Patch and vulnerability management are critical because if you have an IoT device and let's say the manufacturer drops a CVSS 7 or 8 or 10 or something like that and then you scan it and pick it up, uh, we need to be able to to patch that. And if it's just a you know a time clock connected to the network that nobody pays attention to it, you need to go out and touch that device with some type yep. of a tool that's going to tell us that there's a problem yep. with that. Uh, build continuous health checks for se uh, security mechanisms. So your security program that's all going to be driven ultimately by an information security policy, a written information security policy. Make sure you're updating uh, that at least annually or when major system, uh, a major system and organizational changes take, take, uh, take place. Uh, it's not it's not a set it and forget it type of policy. Security policies and programs are something that need to be updated on a routine basis. Yeah. Yep. Continuous basis. Yep. Uh, Pro proactively assess the impact of potential secure of potential security events. So when you see you'll you'll the, look at the, well that that ties in the bottom bullet here. Monitor vulnerability disclosure and threat intelligence uh, sources. And there's a bunch of threat intelligence sources that you coming out of Carnegie Mellon or CERT or Microsoft or Cisco or any of the big players. But also look at uh, the feeds from if you're heavy into. Um, one particular vendor on your network, and there's a million different vendors, so I'm not going to 
you know, drop any names or examples or anything like that. But if you have three, four, five, ten devices from a particular manufacturer on your network, then subscribe to their security feeds. Because if they discover a vulnerability in their stuff or somebody reports a vulnerability in their stuff, then they should report that through their feeds and you should get it through their feeds before you'll get it through through the main ones. Uh, avoid unnecessary unnecessary data access storage and transmission. This is attack surface reduction. That's the seventh bullet here. Minimize attack surface reduction of your IoT ecosystem. When we keep buying and then attaching devices to the network for convenience without thinking about the overarching threat, uh, the over overarching uh, footprint, that, that is going to increase our threat landscape. And think about, um, I'm a big history guy, think about, uh, you know, the battle between the Merrimack and the Monitor, if you remember that, that was the ironclad ships, yep. uh, where most of the ship was actually below the water and only the gun turrets were above the water. So that's attack surface reduction because you're putting most of the attack surface below water. Or think of a soldier lying down in a field. Why do you lie down, you lie down in a field so you don't get shot? Don't get shot, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. So um, one way to secure things is by unplugging things that you don't need, getting rid of things you don't need, uh, deleting data that you no longer need. If, if uh, all data presents some level of risk and it might be a very low level of risk, but don't keep data on your network that you don't need. Unless there's a business case for keeping it, then um, either get rid of it or put it in the cold storage or something like that. So these are these are kind of the academic things. This is an academic uh, answer to this problem. But what can you do right now? Let's say that you have a mess. If you're here listening to this, um, uh, uh, listening to our webinar, it's probably because you have some kind of concerns about IoT. Maybe you have a bunch of IoT devices on your network and you're worried about them. The first thing to do is inventory, inventory everything, identify. Uh, and that's that's part of your cybersecurity program. But identify everything on your network, including IoT, and then tag things that are IoT. It's not computers, it's not servers, it's not routers, it's switches. It's some type of a, you know cheap device that does this or that, and it has an IP address on it. So the first thing we need to do is identify all of those things. And I've always been surprised by those, by network reconnaissance. Again, when I did assessments during discovery, one of the first questions I would ask is, well, how many, what do you have on your network? How many devices? And I usually found a significant difference between what my clients told me they had and what they actually did have. And, and it was usually actually discovered. Yeah. 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 It was usually 25, 30, 40%. Um, I remember one that I did for a French company that was, they had a, a, a um, a plant in California and uh, they they th they said they had 500 uh, things connected to the network, and it was like 900. It was a lot, yeah. and a lot of it was yeah. IoT, and it was all connected to a flat network. Yep. So you need to inventory everything, um, you know, physically with your eyes with a scanner. Use a scanner first, and then take a look at that, and then go verify physically because the scanner might not pick everything up. And then once you've done that, then I would isolate all of that, right? This is this is our 30-day thing because we don't know what this stuff's doing. This is what we do before we do all this academic stuff, right? Um, identify all of it and then sandbox it, isolate it. Put it on a VLAN, uh, put it into a DMZ or a guest network or something like that. Get it away from the production network. Uh, like my example with the casino, let's say that they had – that okay that thing was infected there was a problem with it but if it was isolated on a different vlan from their production network then they wouldn't have been able to move laterally from those ilt devices into the production network so the next thing to do after we identify all that stuff put it on a vlan uh dmc guest network something like that get it away from the production network um, use access control list put it on a vlan use access control list and an access control list is uh, basically, uh, jockeying traffic, what, what, uh, what devices could talk to what devices using which protocols. Um, we don't want to have that wide open. So, um, put it on a, put it on a VLAN, a DMZ, put in some access control lists, then monitor it, um, uh, intrusion detection, data loss protection, firewalls. And these are all technologies that, uh, that one-to-one -one can help you with and then reporting. Uh, so once we have some kind of technology on it, we need to start looking at the reports from this. This is starting from scratch. We don't know, we don't know what's going on and we know that we have an issue. We're worried about it. So let's, let's do this. This is the low hanging fruit. Yep. So, um, with all of that, uh, I want to move into the importance of security and risk assessments, which an, an, over, an overarching cybersecurity and risk assessment, unless somebody has any questions uh, in the chat about IoT before I move on, on to this, but we'll have some time also for, uh, uh, for Q&A at the end here. 
uh, security and risk assessments and the importance of a security and risk assessment is simply because you don't know what you don't know. You just don't know. Like with the fish tank thermometer, they didn't know. Yep. So I'm going to provide another example of that. You see, you see anything wrong with this? It's a service entrance cable on a house, right? We're in Pennsylvania. A lot of, a lot of houses look like this. Incidentally, that's yep. my house. Uh, when I bought it in 2005, and it looks unremarkable, doesn't look like there's anything wrong with it. There actually is something wrong with it. Um, that service inch on, on, on the right there, is, there's no drip loop on it. So when the aerial, the wires get wet, the water could run right down to that. And I'll use my mouse here. Um, the wire could, here's the aerial, let's say water gets on our aerial, it'll run right down into the weather head and then short this thing out. So that's actually wrong. So when you look at service entrance cables, uh, if you see any weatherhead, whether it's for electric or if it's for cable TV um, or internet, it should have a drip loop on it. So when these wires get wet, the water is going to run down this and then drip off this and knock open the weatherhead. And the reason I point this out is because it's an oddball thing that most people, including me, you just wouldn't know. And when you have a security and risk assessment done by one to one, you're going to get a report that's going to be pages and pages of these kinds of things. Well, I didn't know this. I'm not an IT expert. I'm not an electro. I'm not an electrician. I didn't know this. Uh, my home, my uh, home inspector taught me this. Um, but now, um, now that you've seen this, you're not going to be able to unsee it. And whenever you see a service entrance, you know, so <laughs> there's no right. drip gonna... on that. You know, you'll be the be the smartest person in the yeah, car right. at, yeah. at that point in time, right? <laughs> So these are the components of a well-designed cybersecurity solution for your business. And um, I work for ConnectWise. Um, ConnectWise, we have all this. And any enterprise, you're going to have this. When I worked at the White House, we had this. Your defense contractors, um, you know, a Bank of America, General Electric, big companies, so, um, security awareness training, passwords, DNS protection, mobile device security, MDR, computer updates, backups, dark over research. These are all the components of a well-designed cybersecurity re uh, solution for your business, but you have to start somewhere. Um, there's an old saying that the beginning of a million miles begins with the first step. That was Confucius. We were talking about, uh, uh, about Asian yeah. philosophy earlier. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, my grandfather used to say, you have to get up on the roof and pound the first nail. He was a builder. And I don't know if you ever read Confucius, but he was a very smart man. It's the same kind of saying, you have to start somewhere. And you look at all of these things that you need to do. And yes, it might seem, um, a little bit uh, 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 intimidating, right? Just like with my, that, that 10 point slide on securing IOT. Yes, that's in, intimidating. It's a, a, it's a, you know, an academic en enterprise level exercise. And after I wrote that slide, that's why I, I, I made the next one. I said, well, we need to put some low hanging fruit. Okay. Sure. Um, how about a third, what, what can I do in 30 days if I think this is a problem? And those couple of bullets, I think if you had to in 30 days, you could do that if you had you concerns can, about yeah, IOT. Yeah, so let Let's talk about security and risk assessments. And I, I love my analogies. So for a security and risk assessment, we're going to use cars as an analogy. And I went into a search engine and I typed cars and hit image search. And this is what it came up with. I look, you know, I'm a car guy, but let's uh, think about the right cybersecurity. If we wanted to, what are some of the risks that are associated with driving bodily image, uh, uh, bodily in injury, vehicle damage, property damage, theft of the uh, vehicle contents. These are some of the things that we might, might want to mitigate and cars are not cheap. And, uh, you know, driving is frankly, probably the most dangerous thing that an average person does on a day to day basis. Very so true. we all do risk management at some level. When you get in the car and you, you drive it to the store, you know, that there's, you know, that that risk exists and the risk of driving to the store, or driving across country or different, the type of car that you drive, uh, you know, so there's ways that we mitigate this risk. So once we think about the kind of risks that are associated with driving, well, what are we going to do to protect ourselves from these risks? Education, right? You know, um, a dry, I have four kids, um, kid 3.0 just got his license, you know, so I've been down this road a bunch of times, um, vehicle, vehicle maintenance that you, you get your car inspected, uh, once a year, Pennsylvania, you know, we have all kinds of problems with rust. You got to watch out for that. Lock your vehicle doors, roll up your vehicle windows. Um, so we want to detect some type of uh, some type of an event that might adversely affect our well-being or our property or our car uh, vehicle vehicle alarms. Most modern modern vehicles are equipped with lidar. It's amazing, right? They have lidar and they have they have cameras, so you can see a vehicle in front of it and it'll stop itself. My old cars can't do that. Wheel speed ABS sensors. Um, that's aircraft technology, by the way. Uh, in the Air Force, my first job was uh, I was in a crew chief on the A-10 Warthog, and those had analog brakes on them. So analog brakes actually uh, 
came first from aircraft and then moved down uh, into the automotive. Um, so after we've detected an incident, how would we respond to something? Right? Well, lay on the horn. Somebody ran out in front of us, automatic braking. You're not paying attention. Uh, somebody runs out in front of you. That's one of the things I love about modern cars. Even if you're not paying attention, somebody runs out in front of you, a car will stop itself. Stop itself it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's made airbags, lane keep assist. Um, now, now for this analogy, I'm talking about cars here, but now I've added recover to this. But in this case, this might look familiar to you now, Charles. We're talking yep. about uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Identify, yep. protect, detect, respond, and recover. And this is what the right blend of cybersecurity looks like. And I'll also tie this in in my earlier slide about what's the first thing that we could do to protect ourselves from IoT being a problem. Well, we need to identify. We need to know what we have. And identifying IoT is part of that. Once we've identified everything, we need to talk about how we're going to protect it, um, uh, what we're going to do to detect anomalous activity, how we're going to respond to that, and then recover. And recover is just as important as identify, protect, detect, and respond. Um, operating an information system, which we do, uh, we operate our information systems 24-7, 365, and that uh, brings risk. And this is, um, imagine if you bought a house on the coast of Florida or, you know, the Gulf Coast today, you know what's going to happen. Yeah. Eventually a storm's going to come. You, you know yeah. that's going to happen. Um, just empirical experience from being alive as a human because you watch the news, you know that's going to happen. And you, we hope that it's going to be, uh, you know, a tropical storm or maybe a cat one. But what if it's a cat three or a cat five, like what happened to Fort Myers last year, right? Uh, or Hurricane Katrina or that thing that hit Galveston in 1900, killed a thousand people. Um, that stuff happens. Um so we need to be ready for it. So if you're going to buy a house on the Gulf Coast of Florida, you would probably have plywood to keep in the basement, have bottles of uh, bottles of water, MREs, candles, a first aid kit, some maps, uh, some blankets, something to keep warm. And that's what we would do to recover after that, because we know it's going to happen. And this is why a comprehensive cybersecurity program has this respond and recover in place, because we know that an incident is eventually going to happen. And hopefully, again, um, by having uh, the identify, protect and detect in, in place, um, hopefully, we're going to hope that incident is going to be, uh, you know, just that tropical storm or a cat one. But by having our cybersecurity uh, incident response in place, even if it's something really bad, then we're going to be prepared for that. I was just going to say, having the, all those steps in place before you get to the recovery is going to cut down your your recovery time when you, to get you back up and running. So important oh, right. to have all those things in place. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Ab ab absolutely. And, you know, one of my favorite, I have a uh, an anecdote I'd like to share about that that is a good example. Um, one of them, um, we have a lot of partner companies that are like one-to-one. -one. And the thing that I love about MSPs, our managed service providers, I think of you like independent local mechanics, right? Um, yeah, you could go to the dealer, right? Yep. <laughs> and yeah. not that I'm picking on dealers, but, and then you get this big laundry list of, you know, your car needs $2,000 worth of repairs to pass, pass it. Well, no, it really doesn't. Right. Yep. And you, you go to your local mechanic and the local mechanic knows you and, you know, you've been there a bunch of times and say, so, well, um, you know, we'll just patch the exhaust and you could, you know, take the kids to the shore this summer and then next spring, you're probably going to need new brakes. And, yep. uh, but I think that your local MSP is a lot like your trusted independent mechanic. And there's thousands of those all over the country. And they know you and they know your car and they know your business. Yep. Say, uh, they and know your business. Yeah. Yep. Right. And that's that's why they have such a great, great relationship. But um the the um example I was going to use is we have another partner, uh, like one to one that was in Kenosha, downtown Kenosha, when those riots happened. Oh, wow. Um but they had a full blown BCDR program in place because the clients they were working with said, you have to have this stuff in place yep. in order to do business with us. Yep. They had business continuity and disaster recovery in place and they had been practicing it on a year over year basis. And when the, the, the mess started moving in their direction, they declared a disaster and they pulled out their incident response plan, declared a disaster, a disaster and they, and they uh, executed it. And wow. they, they boarded yep. up their windows and they sent people home and they sent people to hotels and they moved stuff in the cloud. And for them, it was no fun whatsoever. It was yep. hard, but there was no impact on their service delivery whatsoever. Right. Their, yeah, their clients had, had no idea place. that any, anything even yep. happened. And it was so because important. they had this um, BCDR in place. And uh, that's the our, our main takeaway here. I'm going to hand off to Charles here in a minute, but one-to-one um, -one could help you by starting with a security assessment and then helping you to know, well, let's go back to my early slide, uh, my earlier slide here, the things that you, what are the things that you don't know, 
what what is it that you don't know about your IT security today? These oddball little things that an expert could come in and then pick out on like that, that you wouldn't know. And um, uh, they could get you set up with a security assessment and then provide you with a couple of pages uh, of, re of reports of things that, well, these this is what you need to know. Um, and I'm going to stop talking and then let you finish up here, Charles, and you could talk about um, your uh, security assessment. <clears throat> Yeah, sure. Well, why don't we open up for questions real quick if anyone um, has any questions. And Jason, thank you so much. This is very, very informative. If anyone wants to either in chat or just come off mute um, and ask a question, feel free to do that. And if you don't have questions about IoT or this subject matter specifically, anything you want to throw out to ask uh, myself or I'm a pretty open guy. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Appreciate that. Well, got a quiet bunch today. Um, you can also send me an email um, with any other questions too, and we can follow up with that. Um, and as Jason had mentioned, um, one to one does offer a uh, IT assessment. Um, so we would have a team available to to work with you and your business to do a deep dive and discover uh, the inventory. Like Jason had mentioned, we can put together an inventory list for you. Um, we can help you complete um, a NIST assessment. We'll help you get compliant in different types of uh, regulations and compliances. And then the, at, at the end of the entire process, you'll actually come away with a playbook. Um, like Jason mentioned, if something were to happen, you know, where somebody got into the system or there was some sort of uh, natural disaster or something that was going to knock your business down for a little bit, uh, we would provide that roadmap and playbook for you um, to avoid uh, long, long downtime. Uh, we have some information on our website where you can actually see uh, what the cost of downtime would be if something were to happen with your IT environment. So uh, with that said, um, if that's something that you might be interested in, please shoot me an email. Um, we can set up a real quick 15-minute uh, call to get to know uh, what you need um, and then get you going with that program. Uh, Jason, anything else you want to add uh, for the group? Well, I think we kind of covered everything as far as the itinerary or as far as our, uh, <laughs> our itinerary was concerned. Yeah, yeah, this is a really great webinar. Really great webinar. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'll open it up one more time. If anyone has any questions before we wrap up, um, if no questions, uh, we'll send out a, uh, a recording of the webinar. Um, and again, you can always email uh, me, uh, Chuck Minguez, C Minguez at one to one inc.com with any questions. And uh, I'll follow up with everybody too. Um, just check in and see, see if there's any questions floating around. Thanks for having All me, right. Charles. I'll yeah, well, to thank see you, Jason. guys pretty soon. You're less yeah, I really less, appreciate uh, 90 it. 90 minutes yeah. from me. Yeah, I hope you come out uh, to an event. I'll send you some information about the events coming up. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you.